here at Catherine Baptist Church, and uh, we're going to have a couple songs for uh, some specials, and then I'll make a few announcements, and then uh, we will jump right into the message, but it's good having y'all here. Uh, the good news, uh, we had a great service Sunday morning, and that was a real blessing. Uh, if you weren't able to be here for that, uh, we invite you to come out this Sunday for our drive-in service. Um, we will be doing... Uh, pretty much the same thing. Uh, we're going to be having the service on the Fellowship Hall porch. And then uh, we had a few folks, I think, on the back side of the church. We're going to try to make it that once it gets full on this side, that then we're going to direct those people around to the other side of the parking lot. So then uh, that way everybody can see. Uh, but the equipment worked out real well, so that was great. Um, but anyway, the good news also is that uh, this coronavirus is uh, subsiding a little bit. Um, it's not nearly, uh, not nearly had the impact that they were anticipating for uh, this past this week and then next week. Uh, so it's looking like it's on uh, the downside. So it looks like we hopefully will get back into a normal routine. I don't think they're setting any time frames right now, but it could be probably uh, a couple more weeks anyway to a month. Um, so anyway, we'll just kind of be directed and, and we're going to continue doing what we've done uh, here on Wednesday night. Sunday night we'll be doing online services also. And then for Sunday morning, uh, we're going to try to continue to do the uh, drive-in service, uh, at least for right now. We might change it up just a little bit, um, but we'll see how the Lord leads in that. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and get started here. So let's have a word of prayer. And then I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth and Nathaniel are going to play a special for us. And then uh, Josh is going to sing a special for us uh, after that, and then I'll preach. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity and privilege we have to be together. And uh, Lord, we, Lord, we surely do miss being uh, all together as one family. And uh, Lord, I just pray that uh, you will help these things get back to normal as soon as possible. But Lord, I pray that during this time that we'll truly uh, realize how much we need church, but also, Lord, how much we need each other. And uh, Lord, may we appreciate each other even more. And uh, Father, I just thank you for your many blessings. Thank you, Lord, that you're still on the throne and you're in control. And Lord, that we can know that we have a home in heaven. And uh, Lord, if there be any watching our services, either uh, live while we're doing it tonight or maybe on YouTube uh, sometime later, then Lord, I'm praying and asking that if they're not saved, that Lord, we would love to see them come to know you as their personal Savior and learn and truly know the love of God. And uh, Father, we just ask and pray these things now and ask you to bless this service as we commit it to you. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, it's...
Thank you all. Wife also being privy to it, 
and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Let's pray. Our Father, we ask you to be with us. I pray that you might, Lord, cleanse my heart and help me, Lord, to be a vessel that is fit for your use. But Lord, I pray also you put the words in my mouth and help me to say only what you'd have me to say. But Lord, I'm asking too that you give us all ears that we might hear from you tonight. And, and Lord, help us uh, with this matter of our heart, just kind of like Ananias and Sapphira. And even as Barnabas, we see in the story here, Lord, there was something definitely different about these individuals. There were some similar things, but there was also a major difference between them. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God might speak to us and work in us as only he can. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've entitled this message, God's Warning to Hypocrites. God's Warning to Hypocrites. Ananias and Sapphira are two individuals that are being referred to here, uh, that I'll refer to them as the hypocrites, and we'll show why they are hypocrites. Uh, here in this passage, and God has a lot of stern warnings to hypocrites, uh, Christians, people who profess to be a Christian. They say something with their mouth, but their actions do something completely different uh, or different from that, then that is what God is warning us against. Now, let me give you a little bit of background here in the story. The church at this time was in the midst of revival. This was an exciting time going on in the early church. Back in chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed. And the number of the men was about 5,000. 5,000 men got saved here at this early time of the church. Revival was breaking out. Skip over, if you would, to Acts chapter 4, and verse 31. It says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. So we see revival has broken out here in this early church. But these people had a genuine heart for the Lord. The Bible tells us that where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And they obviously had a heart for the Lord. How do we know that? Because of what they did with their treasures. It tells us in verse 34 and 35 that many of them that were possessors of lands and houses, they sold them and they brought the prices of those things and they laid them at the apostles' feet. And then we can see in verse 36 there's a specific individual that's pointed out here. And this is the man that was surnamed or nicknamed Barnabas. Barnabas was an encourager. His name actually means comfort. Uh, he was just one of these type of individuals you want to be around all the time. He was always encouraging others. But Barnabas, too, had some land, and he sold it, and he took the money, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, the Bible tells us, as we continue the story into chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, and we see Ananias and Sapphira. Now, I'm not going to say Ananias and Sapphira were horrible Christians. I would say they probably were just an average Christian like most of us. Now, they did something horrible in this situation. But nobody, I don't think, nobody is as good as their best act, and nobody is as wicked as their worst act. We all are sinners saved by God's grace. And because of that, we ought to have, the Bible says, of some have compassion making a difference. We ought to have some compassion and understanding towards other people, especially when they stumble and fall. Now, here are two individuals, Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, we're going to see what happened here in, as we continue on in the message, what took place. But the Bible tells us to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. We're told in 
that it, that's actually Luke chapter 12, verse 1. But in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 6, also in verse 11, and Mark chapter 8, verse 15, we're told over and over again to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. We're told to beware of the leaven of the Sadducees and also the leaven of Herod. We are told to beware of the leaven of these things. And specifically in Luke chapter 12 and verse 1, we're told that this leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. Now, 1 Corinthians 5, 6 says, Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. That means you take a little bit of leaven and you put it in the whole lump and it's going to spread like wildfire. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. But you know the same is true in our hearts. A little leaven gets in our heart. It's going to leaven the whole lump. A little bit of hypocrisy gets in. It's going to make the whole life full of hypocrisy. So the first thing that I see in the message here is ex the expression of hypocrisy. The expression of hypocrisy. Ananias and Sapphira, in verse 1 and 2, says that they had a possession, verse 2 says, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, verse 3 tells us that but it says, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? So here we see two individuals, Ananias and Sapphira, they agreed together and they agreed they were going to do something. Now I would say, and I could take the time and, and expand on this a little bit more, but I'd say these two individuals were proud in their heart. Even as Christians, I believe they're saved. But I would say they were fighting pride. You see, the devil's original sin was pride. That was why he was kicked out of heaven. Pride does a lot of damage. Pride is doing something in your own strength and leaving God out of the picture. That's pride. Well, I can, I've got this. I can take care of this. Pride could also be wanting credit or glory for something that belongs only to God. Some people, as we have... Uh, Elizabeth and Nathaniel and even Josh as he got up here and sang a special as they were doing their specials pride could get in the heart and they could say look at me look what I'm doing that's pride that glory the talent the ability everything to be able to do what you do only belongs to God God is the one who gives it someone has mentioned before that pride is the root that leads to the fruit of hypocrisy. Now, you can call hypocrisy, you can call Ananias and Sapphira, they were pretenders. They pretended to be something they were not. If you look at the story carefully, uh, back again in verse 34 and 35 of the previous chapter, in the midst of revival, people were excited about serving God, and they sold possessions and lands, and they came and took the money, and they laid it at the apostles' feet. Nobody made them do it. They were doing it as unto the Lord. And then here's a man by the name of Barnabas. And he does the exact same thing. As unto the Lord. He is doing it because he has the right heart. Well, there's a couple individuals that see this. They see the recognition that they're getting. They see other things. And they conspire. They have a conspiracy amongst themselves. And they decide they're going to sell a piece of land. Uh, and, but they're not going to give all of the money, but they're going to pretend like they're giving all the money. You see, that's hypocrisy because pride was in their heart. They wanted glory for something that only belonged to God. They pretended, and here's where we have to be careful as Christians. Ananias and Sapphira pretended to have a devotion to Jesus that they did not have. That's where you and I have to be very careful. In our hymn books, we have a song. It's called I Surrender All. We sing this many times during invitation time. I'm not going to sing it for you. <laughs> but uh, the song goes like this. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. 
And then the second verse says, All to Jesus I surrender, humbly at his feet I bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. How many of us have ever sung that hymn before? I think most of us, if you've been in church any period of time, you probably have sung those, those words. And there might have been times you actually meant those words, but do we mean them all the time? You see, what we have to do is we have to guard that little bit of hypocrisy that wants to get into our heart. Over on page 397, it's another song. I have decided to follow Jesus. It says, I have decided to follow Jesus, and then it repeats that three times. No turning back. No turning back. The second verse, though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. The third verse, the world behind me, the cross before me. How many of us have sung those very words? And yet there's been times, and I've seen many over the years, heard of many over the years, that have turned back and walked no more with the Lord. Even his own disciples had this battle in their heart and life where the Bible says that when they were in the garden there of Gethsemane, and then the, they came, Judas came to betray Jesus, and they took him out, and they bound him, and they carried him away. The Bible says that the disciples followed him afar off. You see, they themselves were guilty of having some hypocrisy in their own heart and life. That's what the Lord is trying to warn us against, having this, this false uh, sense of devotion to him. Now we see the exposure of hypocrisy. We saw the expression of it. It comes out in the life. It's, it's when we pretend that we have this devotion to God when it's really not quite there uh, like we're professing it is. But look at verse 3. This is the exposure of the hypocrisy. It says that Peter said to Ananias, Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Now, Satan filled the heart of don't miss this. Satan filled the heart of a believer to lie to the Holy Ghost. How is that possible? That a believer in Jesus Christ can be so directed by the devil himself. Well, here's how. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27, the verse says this, Neither give place to the devil. Now, I've described this verse many times. I've heard it described other ways, and there's a lot of good ways you can describe that verse. But basically, it's kind of like the devil comes to knock on your door, and he says, here I am, and, and you keep the door open. Instead of just slamming the door in his face and says, get thee behind me, Satan, get out of here. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. What we do is we stand there and we talk to him. And he's just like this, these old door-to-door -door salesmen, some of these from years gone by used to be. They stick their foot in the door. They get their, their, his slimy little foot in the door. And once he gets his foot in the door, you can't close the door now. It's a whole lot easier for him to get in. And that's exactly what happens here. That's how Satan was able to fill these believers' heart with this lie, to lie to the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost that lives within each and every believer who knows exactly what's going on in our life. We cannot fool him. But the Bible tells us they lie to the Holy Ghost. You know the devil is the father of lies? John 8, 44 tells us that. The Bible tells us that he's a deceiver. Did you know also in Jeremiah 17, 9 that even our own hearts can deceive us? So we have to be careful. That's why the Bible says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Over in verse 9 in the story, let me continue reading here in verse 4, and I'll get down to verse 9. Verse 4 says, While does it remain, was it not thine own, Peter speaking here to Ananias, and after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. He died. 
And the young men arose, wound them up, and carried them out and buried them. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. Now, that's an interesting thing that she came in three hours after this. Didn't know anything. I don't know if she was wanting to come in and make a grand entrance and be and pretend to be all humble and gracious. You see, hypocrisy had already crept in. Here she comes in three hours later. And then it tells us this as we read on here. In verse 8, it says, And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. You see, they tempted the Holy Ghost there in verse number 9. Now that tempting is when you're testing the Holy Ghost. We can test the Holy Ghost when we purposely, as a Christian, we stop. When, the, when we start to do something wrong and the Holy Spirit convicts us, and we're just like, I don't care, I'm going to do it anyway, that's tempting the Holy Ghost. We don't realize how serious these things are to God. Ananias and Sapphira were more concerned what people thought of them than what God thought of them. So often that's the case with us. That's why we must keep our heart with all diligence. We must guard our heart against the sin of hypocrisy. And God tries to warn us with the seriousness of the sin. He tried to warn the disciples early on about being aware of the, the leaven of the Pharisees. But this was not a spur of the moment sin. This was premeditated by Ananias and Sapphira. They knew what they were doing. This wasn't something they just stumbled across. Sometimes there's sin that we do in the, in the spur of the moment, heat of the moment, and we just do it, and then we're regretful later that we did that. Sometimes that happens. But this was something they purposed ahead of time, premeditated. They tempted the Holy Ghost. It's very dangerous to let any hypocrisy into our hearts. How did God expel the hypocrisy? We see in verse 1 and 2 the expression of it. We see the exposure of it. Both Ananias and Sapphira fell down dead. How did God expel it? Well, Ananias and Sapphira have met with the severest judgment possible. Even though they were saved, they died. The Bible talks about a Christian, how a Christian can die a premature death because of their sin. And I believe the reason is this, because the sin of God's people is far more damaging than the sins of lost people. The reason is, is because we are to be as much as possible above reproach. We're kind of put on a pedestal. And the Bible, Jesus said there in Matthew 5, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You see, we're on that pedestal. And we have to be careful because when we stumble and fall, you know, the higher up the chain you get, if somebody that's in my position stumbles and falls, how many others could that possibly affect? There's a great responsibility. We need to realize the weakness of our own selves. And, and we need to guard our heart with even more care. Because a little leaven, a little hypocrisy, is not only going to leaven our lump in all of us, but it can leaven the body of Christ. Remember, this church was in the midst of revival. Things were, God was doing great and mighty things. Things were happening. Souls were getting saved. People's lives were getting reached. And then a little bit of leaven came in. But you know, someone, as you go through and study the Bible, you study judgments in the Bible. Uh, I came across this somewhere. Someone pointed this out, and I thought, you know, that's really good. 
There are three judgments that a Christian uh, deals with a Christian. Let me give you what these three judgments are. First of all, there's a judgment as a sinner. Well, we are judged as a sinner at Calvary. That means we're not going to have to answer for our sin anymore. When you came to Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, as a Christian, God now, when he sees you, all he sees is the blood of Jesus. Aren't you thankful for that? All he sees is the blood. He doesn't see this old sinful, wretchful man that I am or the person that you are. What he sees is the blood of Christ. We are judged as a sinner at Calvary. But secondly, we're judged as a servant. That'll take place at the judgment seat of Christ. We must give an account of our stewardship while we're here on this earth. And just because we're saved and we're going to get to heaven doesn't mean there's not a judgment waiting for us there. We have to make sure that as we walk uh, this pilgrim highway, we walk on this journey that God has for us, that we are trying to be a good servant and a good soldier of Jesus Christ. But we're also going to be judged as a son or a daughter. We're going to be judged as God's child right here, right now. You see, there's three types of judgments for the Christian. Now, this judgment, I, I don't know how you are, but I remember reading through this story here in, in Acts 4 and 5 about Ananias and Sapphira, and I have always thought, man, that just seems really harsh. Lord, they lied to you. How many times have I lied to you? <laughs> how many times have, you know, I've done something that would seem to be far worse than this, and you dealt with this so severely. I think the reason God did this in the first part of the church when the church was first getting started is because although his judgment was severe, it was also saving. And sometimes God's judgment is saving. I'm thankful that God has chastened me for my sin over the years. I'm thankful because it has saved me, but it's also saved others as I can warn them against the things and the dangers that uh, the sin would lead to. You know, this severe judgment saved Ananias and Sapphira from further sin. God just said, that's it. I'm taking you home to be with me. They had no opportunity for further sin. But you know, it also saved the church. Remember, the church is in the midst of revival, and it saved the church here in verse 11. Notice what it says in Acts 5.11. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Don't you think the church realized what a serious thing it is to try to lie and tempt the Holy Ghost? He lives within us. Oh, what a serious thing it is. We better really. When the Bible says keep thy heart with all diligence. When it talks about those things, when it talks about being renewed in our minds and, and, uh, because it's going to affect our heart, and when it talks about these battles that take place, I think they really understood. You see, it wasn't just some, a head knowledge. It became a heart knowledge. They saw it firsthand. This is the severity of this. But you know what else happened? This is how God's judgment, his severe judgment, was such a saving judgment. Look down, if you would, into verse 14. Verse 14 says, And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. You know what this is saying? I love this. <laughs> because God took a bad situation and he turned it all the way around for the glory of God. And many more people were added to the church. Many more people got saved. Because of this incident right here. You see, it was a saving judgment. Thank God for those judgments that are saving. Thank God that, that even when a little bit of leaven, a little bit of hypocrisy gets into our life, we allow pride to come in and then sin some, somehow shows up and, and we allow these things to happen. God can take that and turn it all around. I'm thankful for that. What a blessing. What a blessing. Souls were saved and brought into the kingdom. The devil thought he got a slimy foot in the door and ruined two good Christians. Thought he had a victory. Now God just took him home and set an example by them 
And thank the Lord he did, because because of that, God ends up turning it all around and gets the victory in the end. Many souls come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, we talked about hypocrisy. But if we find a little bit of leaven, a little bit of that hypocrisy in our heart, how do we fix it? What's the elixir? You know, some of those old uh, westerns, I, I like watching old westerns, and uh, they'll have, sometimes they'll have somebody travel around that's got these little bottles of elixir supposed to fix anything. Yeah. Well, this is not that type of elixir. This is actually a real remedy for the problem. What is God's remedy for hypocrisy? Since pride is what leads to hypocrisy, it can lead to it. Pride is the root, and part of that fruit that comes out is hypocrisy. Since pride is the source, and it leads to hypocrisy, the cure is genuine humility. That's the cure. When we see a little bit of that hypocrisy in our life, that little bit of pretending to be something we're not, or maybe we pretend to be uh, as devotional to the Lord, more devotional to Him than what we really are, when that hypocrisy shows up, the best thing we can do to cure it is have genuine humility. I'm going to turn back to Matthew 13. If you would turn back here with me, I'm only going to have you two passages we're going to look at and then we're going to close here. Matthew 23 and verse number 1. Jesus addresses this and, and stresses to his people, stresses to the disciples the importance of genuine humility. Verse 1 says, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, now listen to this, he's saying, Whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. Now he's telling them, if they tell you to do this, go do it. But do not after their works. Now that seems a little confusing, doesn't it? Do not after their works, but whatever they tell you to do, go do it. What Jesus is saying, their works are, are in the next six words. For they say and do not. He's saying they're hypocrites. That's their works. Don't do after that. But if they tell you to tithe of men, ants, and cumin, go ahead, observe it, and do it. But don't be a hypocrite like they are. Verse 4 says, For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. You see, there it is. That's what Ananias and Sapphira were doing. They were doing it to be seen of men. They wanted the praise and glory that was belonging to God. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called, Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself. Now listen to verse 12. This is the key one. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Now I want you to get those two words there. Humble himself. He that shall humble himself shall be exalted. And then after verse 12, the Lord starts in verse 13 and continues on talking to the, the hypocrites, the scribes and the Pharisees. He calls them hypocrites seven different times throughout the rest of this chapter. But the emphasis that the Lord is trying to teach you and trying to teach me is that we need to guard our heart, make sure there's no hypocrisy, there's no pretending to be something spiritual when there's really nothing spiritual there. Just be genuinely humble. Lord, I'm just, I'm not what, I'm not the man I ought to be. I'm not the woman I ought to be. I'm not the child I ought to be. Don't be a pretender, you young people. Don't be a pretender before your parents. You ought to be genuine with them because they care about you and love you. And they'll be the ones praying for you and trying to help you and encourage you. 
But you know what the devil doesn't want? He doesn't want genuine humbleness. Because when there's genuine humbleness, that means there's confession. And guess what? Confession is it's good for the soul. Confession falls one to another. Pray one for another. But not just with young people, but adults as well. We need to make sure that we have a genuine humbleness. Matthew 18, 4 says, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. James 4, 10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. And then the last passage we're going to look at, and we're going to close right here, is 1 Peter chapter 5. As we're thinking about the, the fix, the remedy, the elixir for hypocrisy. How do we take care of hypocrisy if we see it in our own heart and life? 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 5 says, Likewise, ye younger, be, uh, likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with, what's the next word? Humility. Put it on like clothing, like a garment. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. You know what that grace is? That grace is power and ability that you never had before. Sometimes you say, well, I just don't know how I can do this. I don't know how I can and get this taken care of or I can accomplish this in my life. Well, you can't do it in your own strength, but God gives grace to allow you to accomplish it. But notice what it says in verse 6. Humble yourselves. There's that phrase again. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cared for you. That care that you're casting upon him are distractions. It's worry. It's concerns. It's the, just the needless things we don't need to have in this life. Casting all your care upon him. Why? For he careth for you. But you know what the very next verse is? After the Lord says that we need to humble ourselves in his sight, and then he will lift us up, the very next verse says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You see, Ananias and Sapphira, it would have been nice for them to know this truth. Because they didn't realize Satan had filled their heart. Because of that little bit of hypocrisy, that little bit of pretending to be something they weren't, wanting to get the glory for something that only belonged to God, wanting to have recognition for something that they should have just done it as unto the Lord, and who cares if they ever got recognized for it or not. What they should have done is had a genuine humbleness and humble themselves in the sight of the Lord. That's what God wants for us as well. Let's pray, and as we pray, I'm going to ask you to pray there where you're at, and as I pray here. But if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, won't you trust Him today? The Bible says we are all sinners, every one of us. It doesn't matter. We look at sin like it's a big sin, a little sin. All sin is the same to God. It's all an abomination. And if we sin one time, the Bible says we're guilty as if we've broken one law, we're guilty as if we've broken them all. James chapter 2 tells us that. Because we're all sinners, we all deserve God's wrath and His judgment. We, we deserve severe judgment. Not just dying physically, but dying spiritually, being cast into the lake of fire to burn and be tormented forever and ever. But God loved us so much, that's not what He wants for you and for me. He died on the cross, shed his blood to pay for our sins. And if you will ask him to save you, he promises that he'll do just that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But Christian, God wants to deal with you as well. Is there the tiniest little bit of hypocrisy in our own heart and life? Are we pretending to have a devotion to the Lord more so than what's really there. God knows we're just sinful flesh. Let's not be a pretense. Let's not be a put on to other people. Let's be real. Let's be genuine. But let's humble ourselves. That's the fix. 
humble ourselves and realize that without God, we are nothing. But with Him, we can do all things. That's what God wants for us. Father, we ask you to bless this invitation time. And Lord, each one of us where we are, Lord, I pray that we'll do business with you. And Lord, I've prayed and said it many times. I hope and I trust that as we come through this thing with this virus, Lord, that we will come out the other side closer to you than what we went in. And Lord, we will be truly a humble people. We will be a genuine Christian. Lord, we're not perfect, and we know that. We all have a sin nature we still have to deal with each and every day. But how much more important is it is it for us to get into the Word of God, to know our Savior, to know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings. How much more important that is, especially in this day and time in which we live. Lord, help us to hide Your Word in our heart that we might not sin against the Lord. And Father, I pray that You will strengthen us where we're weak, and Lord, you help our light to shine before men that they truly may see our good works. And Lord, that you may get the glory through it all. Father, may you just use us any way you see fit. And Lord, those things that we've done in our life, that little bit of hypocrisy we've allowed to come into our lives, Lord, I'm praying that you will take that and turn that situation around so that souls can be saved and brought into your kingdom. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for watching our service, and may the Lord bless you.